Okay, welcome back. This is the last lecture of Unit 2 for the Art Appreciation class. And in this, we're going to be talking about the second art impulse um, that we are covering, and that is the impulse to tell stories, right? That uh, at pe when people make artwork, one of the main reasons why they make artwork is to remind people of a story or to actually literally tell the story in pictures. And so we're going to talk about that um, that motivation, why people tell stories with pictures, and what kinds of stories they tell. Okay, and so from the very beginning of artwork, I mean, even to a certain degree, um, in the cave paintings of uh, you know of Chauvet, we see story somewhat of a narrative impulse. But especially when we get to um, the artwork of the ancient civilizations, we see that. A lot of the stories that are told are told in support of the power, right? In support of the kings, the emperors, uh, the powerful people, the, the ruling classes. And we're going to talk more about that in another lecture where we talk about the relationship of art and power. But um, for right now, just keep in mind that a lot of these narratives are just that. They are, in some ways, supporting their... Uh, the, the powers of their time, maybe you could even view them as propaganda. Certainly an image like this, Ashurbanipal stabbing that um, stabbing that lion you know right through the chest while holding him holding him at the neck with his bare hands certainly is a is an image of propaganda. But sometimes artwork is trying to do something the opposite, right it's trying to be in opposition to the to the powers of the time. And we can, once again, we'll be talking more about that in the lecture on art and power. But for right now, I just want to emphasize that there's a flip side to that, that sometimes we see artists clearly making artwork in support of the, the powerful um, institutions of their day and age. But sometimes we see artists making artwork that can be viewed as a critique um, and in opposition to those powers. A lot of the storytelling in the ancient world, a lot of the visual storytelling in, in the in artwork of the ancient world, is telling the stories of mythology. And I think mythological storytelling is really interesting and significant uh, because it, for, it serves multiple functions, right? Mythological storytelling is in part religious storytelling, right? It imparts religious values. It's in part um, an expression of the, you know, support of the powers that be. But also myth is a way that a group of people can talk about who they are as a people and what makes them distinct as a people. And so, and I think the other thing that's really interesting, exciting about mythology is that they can be very allegorical um, and can represent big kind of philosophical ideas, but they do it in very kind of real world specific kind of ways. The behaviors, like if we look at Greek mythology particularly, the behaviors of the heroes and gods are very believably human um, and very flawed. And so a story like this, I don't, for those of you who may not know um, the Iliad all that well, um, this is from a scene from, from the Iliad where Achilles and Ajax are playing uh, some sort of game, like a game of dice, a game of chance, ahead of a major battle. And it was an extremely important kind of passage and scene, for passage meaning a passage of literature, right, um, for, for Greeks of the classical period because it really represented this ideal of Greeks uh, of, uh, of a kind of a, a willingness to accept fate. Okay, a lot of the narratives that we're looking at um, throughout this course are going to be religious narratives. And for right now, um, and once again, there's a whole other lecture just on the relationship between art and religion. But for right now, I just want to make the distinction between the fact that religious stories um, kind of fall into a couple of different categories. And one of the major religious narratives are kind of faith narratives, the narrative of a holy person and how they became a holy person. And so something like St. Francis in Ecstasy or St. Francis 
and the wilderness, depending on what title you prefer for this painting, is very much that. It's an allegorical story, but it's a story about an actual person um, who, you know, a documented um, person that people knew existed historically, um, who had, you know, had a, their own kind of faith journey. Whereas um, some religious narratives are a little bit more closer to mythology, just because for the people who are making this painting, whether um, Judith was an actual, you know, historical person or not, would have been less clear to Artemisia Genileski. Um, so, but it's, it is both a, a faith narrative in that Judith has to live up you know, has to make decisions based on her her faithfulness to God, right? And decides to chop the head off of whole fairness. Um, but also, it's kind of like a it's a a story in in a work, right? It's a it has a, a mythological quality to it as well. Um, so the other thing I wanted to uh, discuss is the idea of what what artwork is really good at telling stories and probably um in, in our modern world it's illustration the commercial art of creating artworks to go with um narratives we see some of the some of the best uh, uh narrative artwork and so right here we're looking at some of the artwork from the golden age of american illustration we have there is a lecture later in the course that will be just on the go on um, illustration and there's a large portion of it that will cover the the golden age of illustration but i just wanted to highlight that right here i feel like this uh scene by ncy um must have been very influential to the directors of um uh what's that tv show i'll think about it moving on um so and of the the type of illustration that probably where the artist has to do the most work in terms of telling stories is definitely children's book illustration. So Maurice Sendak right here and Where the Wild Things Are and Eric Carle. These are both examples of children's book illustrations. And what that means is where the, the writing is very, very minimal, maybe only one or two sentences, one or two lines per page. And so the most of the storytelling has to be done by the artwork. And in fact, in Where the Wild Things Are, um, at a certain point, the artwork takes over the book and there's no text whatsoever. Okay, and so, hold on, how much time do we have? I have about uh, two minutes. What else do we want to cover? Well, we do have some more to cover. I don't know if I'm going to get it all done in two minutes. So what I want to say about uh, La Meninas is that it's complicated. Um, storytelling can be, you know, seemingly simple, right? Two guys in a forest uh, worried about possibly being hunted down by someone, right? Looking over their shoulders. Or storytelling can be very, very complex. And in a painting like La Meninas, the narrative is extremely um, subtle and complex. And I'll, so I want you to think about a little bit of like, what really is the story that this painting is telling, right? When we first look at the painting and we first think about, well, what is this painting about, right? The title of the painting, La Meninas, right? Uh, the Maids of Honor, right? Refers to the young ladies who are here, right? To amuse the young princess. Okay, we only have a minute left, so I'll just have enough time to talk about this painting. They're here to, to amuse the young princess. And she really in many ways feels like she's the centerpiece of the painting, but the painting is not called La Principessa, right? It's not the princess, it's the maids of honor. So that raises a question, and why are they there to amuse her? And why is she here, right? She's standing in front of an artist and he's painting on a canvas, but she's way too close to him for him to be painting her. Also, she's standing with her back to him. All of these people are standing with their backs to the artist and they are instead facing us. So who is the subject of the painting that the artist Velasquez is, is painting here? That is an interesting question. If we look to the mirror in the back of the room, we start to get an idea of who the subject of the painting is. I will cover the rest of this in the next half of this lecture.